your views matter. Hello, 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 everybody. Assalamualaikum, sastika, namaskar to all the listeners. This is Attorney Sharp Rali for another Sharp Rali Law Show, and uh, today is February 14th uh, and Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's! And I wanted to tell people that uh, today we have a lot of news, and I'll have also with me uh, a Sharif uh, Sharif Silmi, an attorney in our DC office. And we'll be talking, hopefully, about O-1 visa and national interest waivers and EB-1. But uh, before we, we get Sharif online, I wanted to make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Michael, for helping me today. And also, anything I'm going to tell you today is for educational purposes only. You should not act or refrain to act solely on the information provided. You should contact an attorney if you have any questions. A lot of things happen. So I apologize for that. So first of all, I wanted to give an announcement on the, the changes on the Form I-539. As you know, the Form I-539 is for change of status or extension of status. For example, let's say you have an H-4 visa, you want, uh, you want to extend it, or you want to move to an F-1, you use that form. But now, uh, this form was pretty straightforward. Now, the USCIS as from March 2011, they are going to make it a little bit more complicated. They have introduced something called an I-539A, uh, and plus they have also introduced what we call basically the fingerprint. As you know, uh, when you were doing the I-539, for example, an H-4 uh, extension, you didn't need to have a, you didn't need to get fingerprinted, but now they are going to ask for that. Also. Uh, if you had a dependent, the dependent was usually included on the application. Uh, so uh, it's uh, now you will have to file a separate I-539A for each. Let's say you're filing for your wife uh, and children. Uh, usually it used to be one 539, everybody was included there. Now you will have to file one form I-539 and you will have to file, let's say you have uh, one, one, ch one child and, and your wife she will have to file another I-539A, and for the child also, you will have to file I-539A, and you will have to pay two fingerprints. Even if it is uh, only a child, they will still ask for the fingerprint. This is kind of unfair, but uh, let's see how this unfolds. Uh, it's going to delay everything now, because already, as you know, there's a uh, the change of status, or even uh, extension of status using the I-539 has been delayed forever. Now with the fingerprint method, we're going to talk about some major uh, delays. So get ready for that. Uh, the question is that what happens when you go outside the country and you want to come back and you just want to go and get uh, a step of your of your H4, or et cetera, you have to be fingerprinted. So that's uh, something that uh, concerns the Department of State, so we'll have to wait and see. Uh, right now, at this point, I think we we are uh, uh, so we have to we have to actually kind of uh, make things uh, work for people. And uh, and right now, it's it is it is very difficult. It's getting more difficult. Uh, so it's not it's not going to be a a piece of leisure now to do things because. Uh, cases are going to get complicated and there will be more work on them. Uh, it has been happening anyway. Now it's just adding up onto it. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that, but mainly today the topics we're going to be talking about is O-1 visa, EB-1A, of course, and national interest wa waiver. So I, I want people to actually kind of uh, know that we we have a way of of dealing with those kind of cases, and I'm hoping to have Sharif uh, calling in a few to join us, uh, and uh, and uh, also talking about um, about O-1 visa, especially today. And uh, one important thing I wanted to mention is um, is that we are we are seeing a lot of people getting uh, 
are going to basically jump onto the H-1B in the next few months, uh, the H-1B wagon, as we call it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, of course, they, they said they're going to change the lottery system, but it's still a lottery, except uh, they have not really implemented that, by the way. Um, but they, it's going to be a little bit more difficult, well, not easy, I supposedly. First, you will have the pre-selection, then you will be moving forward in filing the case. But the, the, the thing is just like, you will still be through a lottery. So if there are 300,000 applications, they will still give the, uh, the amount allotted. Even though they are increasing it by a little bit, I think by 5,000 or something, we're still going to have to struggle with some kind of lottery. Now, having said that, I think it's uh, one of the things is, uh, is to actually kind of uh, work, um, work with, uh, with other uh, options, right? For example, if you're not born in India, you might be looking into an EB-1. Now, let's say you were born in India, you still have extraordinary abilities, especially the students graduating in, uh, in many uh, uh, very important uh, topics, uh, I mean, uh, important, uh, not topics, but important subjects, they might be eligible for, um, for the O-1 visa. And for the employers out there listening, uh, you don't have to always rely only on H-1B. So the O-1 visa might be an option for you to bring your candidate on bo- aboard. Uh, and then uh, it's, it's a little bit more tricky that, than a, it's, uh, it's, that it sounds. But bottom line, it's, it is possible. So it is also, uh, it is something that you need to be, to be aware of because that's why we're going to discuss about and I'm hoping I'll have Sharif on, on board, and uh, and uh, he will be able to talk a little bit about that because we've been doing it in a different way, just like the EB1, and uh, well, we got we've been getting approvals too. Uh, although we have not done many O1 at this point, we're still taking a new approach to it, and it's working. So we're going to now kind of offer that uh, as um, really a different way of uh, basically kind of an alternative. Is this Sharif? Yes. Hi, Attorney Shaw. Sharif Silmi. How's it going? I'm doing well, Sharif. I'm doing well. Can you speak a little bit louder because I I cannot hear you really well. Can you? Is that, can, uh, can you? Sure. Can is you that a me? little bit better? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So, Sharif, uh, thank you so much for joining today. We had our last show. It was really about it. Was uh, people really love it? Uh, talking about EB1A and congratulations to your team for really making this happen for many people. Uh, the EB1A, we, we had some very uh, big success stories, but today uh, I'm, I want to have you to talk a little bit about the O-1 visa uh, because that's one of the options that is available for people from India, uh, especially when they, they, the H-1B is not available. And plus, ultimately, they can also file the EB-1 while the time they're on O-1. Talk, tell us a little bit about this, Sharif. Indeed, indeed, uh, Attorney Sean. Thank you again for the opportunity, and uh, it has been a wonderful start to the year, so it's nice to join everyone again together. Um, the, the O-1 visa is really something that is uh, unfortunately overlooked by a lot of uh, individuals. Um, so when we're looking at an O-1 situation, I think that any person out there that is coming from um, you know, some of the better institutions uh, overseas, or if, for example, they completed their undergraduate studies in India and they are uh, have com- now completed a master's degree in uh, United States and then transitioned to um, a STEM OPT program, and they're working in science, technology, engineering, you know, mathematics, research, etc. I certainly would suggest that they um, speak with their employer regarding O1 or. Uh, you know, to discuss with us what the options and pathways are. Now, the uh, main, uh, I think, understanding that folks should come away with with respect to the O1A is that it is a great alternative to the H1B, particularly if you're concerned about a cap. So the, there's, there, it's not subject or remotely, uh, you know, uh, at risk of cap or, or exceeding the limitations at this point. So the O-1 is definitely available for people who um, fit the qualifications. 
and it is grants a greater level of certainty and stability for those individuals. And also, I think that it puts them on a trajectory to a future in which they will be able to uh, transition to a green card through an EB1A process potentially. However, um, the uh, so, so my c- class of individuals that I would look at and that we've been successful in terms of um, moving over to an O1 and not having to be restricted under some of the limitations of the H1B would be folks who are um, in a STEM OPT scenario and are looking for uh, you know a, a more stable situation for the long term. Yes, uh, exactly. So, Sharif, uh, for people who need help on the O1, before we dig into a little bit uh, on the O1, what what we can, uh, what kind of um, jobs might qualify, or of course qualifications. If people need help, they can call us at the office five one zero seven four two five eight eight seven. I apologize today we are not going to take any live calls because. I have uh, Tony Silmi, we have Sharif with me, and we want to discuss about O1 as an alternative. We've been talking a lot about problems, so we are trying to, to talk about solutions now, because uh, for weeks now we have been seeing a lot of issues going on with RFEs and H1B, uh, roller coaster in the system, uh, H1B system like going to change, but yet uh, they have not given us the instructions. And now they have this H4, the I-539 form, which is changing, which is adding more work and more stress on people. So all those are, are kind of bad news, but we we want to talk a little bit about uh, optimism and, and basically be optimist that we can look into other options, for example, like the O-1 visa. And uh, Sharif, what would you tell us, uh, our listeners about, about the typical O-1 that you you might see with all those cases we have worked on. Yeah, so uh, Attorney Shaw, I think that the fir- the primary um, individual that is working in a data science uh, endeavor should absolutely look at the O-1 visa. I think it is particularly interesting for um, someone that is in IT and is doing uh, projects because while there are uh, correlation between the O1A visa and an EB1A scenario, the stringency of the adjudication process is uh, far less. So you have individuals that you know might only be three or four years removed from a uh, you know institution of education and have been implementing projects uh, even in a uh, consult IT consultant role that tend to uh, fit and, and be qualified for O1. And that would, so that would kind of be one um, part of the, one aspect of, of the uh, qualified individual, all the way to someone who has a PhD and is, you know, doing major, maybe biomedical research or other sorts of facets. Uh, so, so there's a really a wide range of folks. However, I think uh, for my vantage point for immediate relief, I would say that anybody in science, technology, engineering, and research that is on a STEM OPT really um, will be better served by an O1A visa than an H1B where they're uh, basically controlled, you know, under total and complete domination and control by the employer. Uh, O1 is still an employer-sponsored visa, however, you can move around a little bit more freely, and it does open up a potential pathway to a green card through uh, repositioning a lot of the evidence that you're gathering for the O-1 process into an EB-1A down the road as you uh, increase it. One thing I'd like to point out, though, in terms of the evidentiary criteria for an O-1A visa is, um, you know, something that I think... You know, the uh, folks out there, the layperson may not be thinking of, and we as attorneys, you know, we think for you in this regard. So um, a lot of people are familiar with the 10 criteria that exist for EB1A. With an O1A, you actually have eight criteria. And when you look at the two criteria that have been removed from the process that are no longer there, they relate to um, 
you know, having works of art displayed at a uh, showcase or a exhibition and commercial success in uh, box office or theaters. What that what, so what Congress's intent for the O one is uh, to have the O one used specifically for economic and technological advancement. That is why someone who is in data science, science, technology, engineering, math, research is prime uh, for an O one A. So the uh, the criteria that that are looked at, and here you have. Um, a more specific focus on meeting um, a minimum of three of the evidentiary criteria than you do with EB1A, which needs kind of a larger focus, you still need to um, have the uh, appropriate balance of communicating where you fit within benefiting the national interest of the United States and that you're working in an area that is intrinsically benef beneficial. However, the uh, focus on, you know, having memberships and associations that require outstanding achievement of its members as judged by national or international experts in the field is, is certainly uh, one that many people out there can qualify for. And you can, you know, speak with somebody here that can kind of point you in the right direction. Um, uh, original technological contributions or original business-related contributions to your field. So if you've worked as an IT consultant on some major projects, that could be positioned as an original business-related contribution of significance to your field. Um, then you want to look at whether you command a high salary um, or other remuneration. So it could be beyond salary. Maybe you were paid, for example, through stocks or bonuses, uh, benefits, et cetera. Um, that is certainly highly relevant to this uh, to this process, and that you've participated either individually or in a group um, in the uh, review of the work of others. And again, a lot of people confuse this by assuming that you need to review journal articles or papers. However, a reviewing or judging the work of others can actually be in a professional context. So, uh, you know, for example, yeah. if one is working in on a particular project and then there's a unrelated project that they are not involved in that um, whoever's you know uh, working on that that uh, second project asks them to come in and conduct some review of some sort based on their expertise then that may be evidence of meeting that criteria and the big one is that you are uh, or that you have been uh, employed in a critical, or essential role for an organization of distinguished reputation. So again, when you're um, looking at this, you can see if, for example, you've been uh, even you know contracted out to certain you know companies or organizations where you've served in a critical role, or you have in the past worked directly for that company. So again, meeting a minimum of three of these eight criteria. Um, is, is required, and then there's also receipt of lesser national or international awards and prizes. So meeting a minimum of eight of uh, three of these eight criteria is what's required for an ONA, along with you know sponsorship by uh, a, an employer. Again, uh, Sharif, um, just to let the, the listeners know, this is Attorney Sharif Silmi. He's with our office, um, help uh, basically kind of. Um, Managing the the department and uh, and working on all the cases on EB1 and uh, also national just waivers and uh, and we are talking about O1 today. So I, I wanted to tell the listeners that uh, we have a you can check the reviews for Sharif. He he's been called now the wizard of EB1. So hopefully he will be now the wizard of O1. So let's see how it works. But Sharif. Um, one thing that many people are uh, asking is, uh, is uh, why should they go for an O1 if all the requirements are already met for an EB1? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the answers is, of course, for India, EB1 is not completely current, and it is a good idea to go for an O1 while waiting on their EB1. But uh, what will you tell to people why they should they might be able they might choose an O1? Uh, 
and uh, also uh, a, a, and don't uh, do an EB1 at the, uh, until further notice. So give us a little bit uh, some distinction where uh, why an O1 might be better for someone. Well, I think that if we're looking at the differences between an EB1A and an O1A and the, the types of distinctions that exist, it will be really looking at the level of scrutiny that is applied to the case. So, for example, one who may be um, a couple, two or three years removed from graduate school um, may qualify for an O1 situation. However, it would be very difficult to make that same individual uh, qualify for EB1A unless there are some really, um, you know, extraordinarily um, you know, special things regarding the accomplishments that have been made. Because one of the main uh, aspects when we're looking at the plain language meaning of the statute that an EB1A requires is sustained a claim. So the word sustained is taken very seriously by the adjudicating officers. So we would have to really demonstrate that over a period of time that, uh, you know, there has been accom accomplishments and achievements. So we have been able to do that successfully in many, many cases, so it's still worth looking into in the EB1A context. However, in the O1A context, it is available for folks who have really just come out of, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a good level of, you know, master's degree and are working in a STEM OPT situation. So the, the scrutiny is less. And the other uh, aspect is that you're backed by your employer. Uh, for the most part. So it's not a self-petition. So you are tied to the employer a little bit more. Um, but again, it's a work. It's, it's really an alternative to an H-1B rather than an alternative to an EB-1. However, it is a step toward potentially qualifying for an EB-1. Um, but you, you, again, have far less scrutiny with an O-1 uh, than you otherwise do with the EB-1A. So that would be the, sc the level of scrutiny is clearly uh, less. Um, the other thing that I think is enticing about the O-1, and this gets a little bit complex, so I don't want to get into it too much and cause confusion, so I would recommend that you really um, you know, try to uh, have a more personalized uh, approach to this. However, entrepreneurs can definitely benefit from the O-1A visa because you can actually um, figure out a way to to have an organization set up to sponsor um, the work that you're doing. So um, that pathway is there for the O1. It is, you know, a little bit more complicated um, than than you could generally put out there. But certainly for people who are interested in entrepreneurship, um, the O1A is absolutely. A, a, a excellent tool that is there for you where, for example, the, the EB-1 um, might not quite be, someone's uh, level might not be, uh, you know, at the kind of optimal point in order to, to, to seek an EB-1A approval. However, they can certainly qualify for O-1. And then for folks from India, that is definitely a challenge, particularly if you are an F1 with an OPT, uh, you know, extension, even STEM extension, because if you're going to apply for an EB1, then, um, and the priority date is not there, you do not have a previously approved I-140, it's, it, it could uh, potentially, you know, cause some issues if you're not able to move to a different visa while you're waiting on your priority date to become current. Exactly. So. This is a very interesting point uh, Tina Sharif brought up, ladies and gentlemen, and he's talking about potential for entrepreneurs to use the O-1, although we I have not personally tried it, but I think uh, uh, it will work because there's no real uh, the requirement is, is very different when it comes to an O-1. Now, uh, Sharif, uh, one thing which you, you mentioned a lot uh, are the employers. A lot of employers find themselves stuck when they cannot get there after the graduation of the students and they cannot, uh, they get an OPT but it's limited and then they cannot move forward. Uh, the, and the H-1B doesn't get picked up in the lottery, etc. So 
would you what what is what is the message you can you can have for those employers, uh, especially the consulting companies? I think they they really are struggling to keep their staff, and uh, I think uh, one options might be one of the options might be an O one. You know, absolutely, uh, Attorney Shaw, and one of the. I guess frustrations I have with trying to make people's lives better is sometimes we as individuals, particularly, um, you know, uh, although I was, you know, born and raised in this country, I have a close connection with immigrant communities. And a lot of us, you know, that come or hail from, you know, areas of Middle East and Southeast Asia, et cetera, have kind of a mentality of, you know, like, oh, it can, if, if, somebody I know has not done this, then it's impossible. And I'm a, maybe it's something in America or whatever. I don't think there's anything that's impossible. Nothing is, uh, you know, um, I think it was uh, Nelson Mandela uh, is the one that said that it always think, it always seems impossible until it is done. And that those are words that I live by. So um, when we're looking at um, these kinds of situations, we really need to think that, you know, what exactly is the possible, uh, all the possible scenarios for my situation. And when uh, folks out there with consulting companies are just following the same, you know, methodology, not adapting, not changing, not trying to reposition themselves, um, that is actually going to, um, you know, create a very stale uh, business model. So if you're able to attract higher level talent that you can even market as meeting these very, you know, um, interesting requirements such as, you know, all of our uh, uh, staff have original contributions of major significance. All of our staff have performed in critical role for organizations that have a distinguished reputation. All of our staff have reviewed the work and judged the work of other professionals. All of our staff are members of organizations that require outstanding achievement of its members. All of our staff have you know lesser national or international awards so when you're able to market those skills and achievements as um, you know in a consulting IT consulting uh, uh, scenario then you've really um, enhanced and and um, distinguished yourself from other people out there and not only that but you still are able to um, you know position yourself to carry out this uh, function so if, for example, you want to recruit people from IIT in India, I mean, certainly those people are going to uh, meet the uh, EB1, I'm sorry, the O1A qualification. So, you know, those are really people that you can bring on board and uh, position to, to do excellent work here that is in very, very high demand in the country. Or people who are on STEM OPT that are really concerned about not, you know, getting picked up in the H-1B situation, you can give them an opportunity to join your organization as, you know, an O-1A recipient. So this is really um, an important move, but it's not going to be done if you're thinking the same old ways and that nothing ever changes. The only thing that I've been doing for 15 years and this is what it's going to be, um, that's, that is not going to be a pathway to success. Um, you know, the <clears throat> adjudication process does change from one administration to another. It's not necessarily a Trump thing only, although there are unique things and unique uh, struggles we're running into with the Trump administration. Um, it is not only about Trump. There's always going to be changes from one administration to the next in terms of how the adjudication process takes place. You need to be able to adapt. And, and right now, there is a willingness to accept highly skilled workers. So if you're able to position yourself in, in data science, particularly, um, you know, cloud-based security infrastructure, um, all of those uh, IT specialty areas will absolutely find a way for you. Um, and, and you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're at the mercy of the cap and you know, thinking, oh, do I go to Canada? Do I go to, you know, Australia? Do I go back to India? Well, no, there's a place for you here because there's demand. There is demand. Wherever there's demand, uh, there's going to be a pathway. Uh, we're not going to let the 
uh, immigration laws interfere with our clients' abilities to contribute to the society. So, you know, I'm very passionate about that and making sure that we find a uniquely tailored approach to meeting our clients' needs. Exactly, Sarif, and I really appreciate the, the honesty and the, the way things are working. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually a work of art, again, I said that last time. Uh, it's not like taking a bunch of puzzles and trying to piece it together. Uh, at the end of the day, most of the time, you won't really be able to piece it together because the glue that holds that is this is where the talent is, this is where you are doing an excellent job and your team is uh, is doing an excellent job. So I wanted to congratulate you guys for that. So um, just to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is Attorney Shaprari and I have Attorney Sharif still me with me uh, on the show today and we're talking about about O-1 visa and of course we'll talk a little bit about EB-1 and ultimately uh, uh, about national trust waiver. So Sharif, before we, we move on uh, uh, to national trust waiver, what will you uh, kind of recommend to our listeners if in case they, they think they might qualify for an award? Yeah, the first thing I would recommend is that you reach out and have uh, an assessment. You know, you you can certainly um, contact our office. I know that, you know, Shah has provided the number uh, several times on this call and that you've listened to our show before. Um, but also don't fall into the trap of depending on your, uh, I think, you know, this this is obviously for education purposes. I wouldn't want to rely on this for, for uh, as legal advice. You do need to seek out an attorney if you, if you want to make a decision. Uh, however, I would generally suggest that one not rely solely upon the attorney at the company that you work for. And I'm not saying that because they are not great attorneys. They are great attorneys. However, their duty and their loyalty is to the company, it's not to you. So um, you need to make sure you have independent counsel that is assessing and uh, looking at your needs and your interest. So even if you end up going into a situation where you will have a company-sponsored uh, petition, such as an O1A, such as an H1B, you really need to have independent counsel that can assess your situation and advise you properly and even handle your case if you can convince your employer because the duty of loyalty is a very serious thing in the legal profession and those uh, attorneys that are working directly for the employer um, or you know, corporate counsel are going to be very loyal to the company. But you have a life, you have children, you have a home, you have real day-to-day uh, -day struggle that you need somebody that really understands that and cares about that. So um, ultimately, you know, that would be my advice. So have an independent counsel that cares about your interest first. So Sharif, um, having said that, I think uh, people should look into the O-1 visa. The O-1 visa is always available. Uh, there's no backlog and no waiting time. If you feel you qualify for in, uh, uh, the O the the O one visa, and you're not sure, feel free to reach out to us at five one zero seven four two five eight eight seven. And also, uh, just to let people know that Attorney Sharif handles all the EB one cases and national interest waivers, most of them in our in our Washington office. So Sharif, uh, now. Let's just kind of talk a little bit about national interest waiver. We have focused a lot on EB-1 last time, but we have not really talked about uh, the standards of national interest waiver because there are no real standards. They are all made by case law. So I wanted you to tell people what are the, uh, what are the opportunities. One of them, of course, is to have an I-140 approved, which they can use to extend H-1B, etc. But tell us a little bit about the national interest waiver and the kind of cases you have won. Sure, sure. You know, um, I, I really, uh, I really actually love the national interest waiver. I think it's actually something that Congress did a very good job of crafting and making sure that we are um, attracting the right talent in our country. Because what the national interest waiver is about is about making sure that we have people that are working in what the government describes as 
areas that are intrinsically benefit beneficial to the United States. So what that means is that if you work in an area that is of natural benefit to the U.S., um, then that you're you're going to be in a position to uh, qualify for a national interest waiver. So uh, you look at the different fields that are out there. So the first part of the test for national interest waiver, uh, just to back up a little bit, is that you have a master's degree. So if your education level is at a master's degree or you have a combination of a bachelor's degree and the requisite amount of work experience, that needs to be looked at. It's kind of a complicated analysis. Or a master's degree, then you have taken your first step to a national interest waiver. The next step is here, uh, Sharif. Uh, it's usually sure. five years of experience for the bachelor, and the bachelor has to be a four years of academic uh, equivalent. Because using just purely experience, you cannot really do the national interest waiver. Just to insert that exactly, <laughs> exactly. And some of our um, you know, listeners might have a, an equivalency that's only good for three years, so you have to look at the work experience and make sure that you meet the, the requirement. The um, So the first requirement after you establish the education work experience is that you work in an area that is intrinsically beneficial to the United States. This, again, is like, you know, Attorney Shaw was saying, uh, artwork, because we have to make the case that what you're working and what you're doing is in the national interest of the United States. So what we're talking about are definitely uh, engineers, science, technology people, data science. All of those interesting areas are going to be areas that are uh, intrinsically beneficial to the United States. Researchers, medical, biomedical, certainly doctors, physicians. Uh, there, There's a very wide range of folks who may qualify for national interest waiver. Uh, I think one area that is constant o- overlooked in national interest waiver, again, uh, entrepreneurs, educators can also be uh, qualified for national interest waiver. We, um, again, look at, so here, the first part of the analysis, we're not looking at the individual applicant. We're looking at the applicant's area of endeavor. What area do they work in? The second part of the examination is looking at whether the person is well positioned to fulfill that intrinsic need that exists. So now we've established that you work in an area of intrinsic need. Second, we want to look at are you, the applicant, well positioned to fulfill this area of intrinsic need that we just described? So, for example, we look at the success examples that we have in-house. Um, the intrinsic need that exists is to have folks who work in petroleum engineering, right? Energy acquisition, United States leading the world in, in energy supply. So that is the area of intrinsic need. You are well positioned to fulfill that need because you have certain expertise in uh, reservoir analysis, meaning oil reservoirs that exist in the ground, you have certain data calculation skill to figure out what the, you know, uh, the, the areas of, uh, are most beneficial to be exploited, things like that. And these are general issues, just, you know, hypothetical scenarios, not from any particular case or anything like that. Um, the other kind of area can certainly be people that work in, uh, again, data science, technology, um, advancing security for uh, data, data warehousing, um, working in anything that touches uh, a state agency or federal agency. If you work for a consulting firm that touches any kind of state or federal agency, you're definitely in an area of intrinsic need. Now, how do we prove that you are well positioned to fulfill that need? This, again, comes to education. I would say the education aspect in national interest waiver is far more relevant than it is in an EB1A context. An EB1A context is going to look solely at your professional work. National interest waiver, we're going to look at your education. Even what classes did you take? How well did you perform? What groups were you involved in? What does your professor say about you? These things become relevant when it comes to whether 
you are well positioned to fulfill the intrinsic need that exists. The entire analysis for national interest waiver is based on a case called Danasar, D-H-A-N-A-S-A-R. Danasar says that you have to, that, that all of these types of evidence must be accepted by the USCIS. So what's beautiful about the national interest waiver is we already have the appeal decision precedent that we know what is the uh, you know, minimum that the government has to accept for approval. So really, we can, we can look at folks and determine with pretty strong precision whether or not they're going to meet the requirements and um, fulfill the, the specific requirement of whether they're going to be well positioned to fulfill the intrinsic need that exists in the United States. The last requirement is going to be that you are on balance, I'm sorry, the last requirement is that on balance, when we do a balance test, it is more beneficial to the United States that we have the applicant work in this area of intrinsic need based on their uh, well positioned, uh, uh, based on them being well positioned to do so, and and that it is on balance better to have them in this area than it is for to force them to go through the labor certification process. So ultimately, the entire thing boils down to the balance between having this person fulfill a national interest need of the United States versus having them go through a labor certification process where it will have a few safety safeguards in place to protect U.S. workers. So is the risk to U.S. workers um, lower than the benefit that we're going to get by having this highly skilled, well-positioned individual that is working in a area that is intrinsically beneficial to the United States. That is the ultimate test. And there are many ways to really do this under, I, it gets me excited. I'm sorry, I don't want to go on and on and bore your listeners because not all of them probably you know, will will fit this area, but it is it is really exciting uh, stuff and an excellent way for basically anybody that is is well educated, working, doing serious work that they care about and that it's making a difference in the world. And you want to come to the United States, whether you're in Australia, whether in Europe, whether you're in uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, South America, you have a pathway through the National Interest Waiver. And I am waiting for the day that the uh, backlog for India is eliminated so that we could basically, you know, process all of these green cards through national interest waiver because many, many highly skilled people qualify. Unfortunately, it is a second category immigrant visa. Therefore, you will still be subject to the country quota of origin. Exactly. However, Sharif, I wanted to point out to all our listeners uh, just to let you know, we are, uh, we are in conversation with Attorney Sharif Silmi from our D.C. office, and we are talking about, first we talk about O-1 visa, and now we're talking about national interest waiver. A lot of people ask me the question, why should I file a national interest uh, waiver when the waiting time is so long? Well, my answer is very simple. Number one, if you file a national interest waiver, you don't have to depend on an employer. This is one of the two uh, green card uh, employment days, uh, EB1 is one, and National Interest Waiver is two. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, um, it's important if you have uh, a national, you can file the National Interest Waiver, you don't need an employer. Number two, the National Interest Waiver is filed by, by, by yourself. So it's a self-petition. That means if you shift company from company A to company B, you you on H one B for example, you still can uh, can basically continue using the same labor certificate. Well, there's no labor certification, but the same national trust waiver to ultimately get your green card. So um, it is important to understand national trust waiver. Although many people feel like, hey, this is not something uh, I should be even be considering. So think again before you just give up and give us a call. 
510-742-5887 and the website is attorneyonair.com attorneyonair.com so Sharif now uh, we talk about national trust waiver let's talk about your baby the EB1 uh, another, and one thing that I wanted to tell people uh, a lot of people call us for EB1A of course but there's also the EB1B for scientists and uh, outstanding scientists and professors so uh, if you have a university or some kind of institution uh, helping you, you might be able to file at EB1B. Uh, I don't know if we did uh, any EB1B recently, Sharif. Do you remember? No, I don't think so. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, you know, the, the one there was actually a recent case. It's interesting. The, the only reason I would mention it is that uh, because when you are looking at an EB1B, you can also file EB1B if you work for a private employer. However, that's only the case if the work that you're doing is solely research-based. So for many folks out there that reach out to us about EB1B, I actually end up moving them to an EB1A situation because what usually happens is when you actually dig in deep, you find that if they're working for a private employer, that is, is that they're working in a research and development role because this is like out of economic necessity. You're not going to have the same kind of public funding, um, grant-based research in private institutions as you are having in the public institutions, unless it's a really, really uh, specialty area of research. So if you are looking at an EB1B, the one thing I would tell you is the limitations on, number one, having an employer sponsor your petition, and number two, that it has to be solely research-based. You, it has to either be that you're working in a research or professorship, tenure-track professorship in a university, right, or a research, public research institution, or you're working in um, a private institution doing work that would otherwise be happening in a public or a private university scenario. So that is the key factor there. So when you actually start to dig deep um, and find folks that are that are in, you know, for example, in Silicon Valley, a lot of these, you know, like biotech or, uh, you know, kind of scenarios, you're you're especially if you're filing patents, things like that, you're probably doing a lot of product development. So Definitely. those folks, I would encourage you to look at EB1A, especially if you're, uh, you know, earning uh a very high salary, then then certainly EB1A is going to be uh, an important move for you. That's that's really great. Really great. I don't know how much time we're left, Michael. I think we're left with like two three minutes. So I'm going to wrap up a little bit and have Sharif just say some final words, and then we will move to the uh, uh, to the people for the next show. So Sharif, if you had a, a quick recommendation for our listeners, uh, especially the employers, what will you advise them to do? So um, what I would advise them to do is is really to work with um, someone like like us, someone like um, you know Shop Rally, to really uh, find a way to um, fundamentally change the way you think about doing business and um, position yourself in a way that's going to be good for 2020 and beyond. It's no longer 2005. It's no longer 2006. So, you know, you have to really change the way you're doing business and change what the offerings are to people. So if you are an existing employer, that's really what I would tell you to do is you, you really need to change, fundamentally change the way you're doing things. And the old way is even, it's not just the Trump thing, it's, it, it's, there's pressure. There's going to be pressure on the type of, um, you know, work, that that we've been uh, doing, the government interest is shifting. So the same H-1B consultant type uh, scenario, it, it may not last very much longer. You're seeing how much difficulty they're giving you. So explore other pathways. That, that's what I would say there. Exactly. That's, that's uh, the motto of our, our firm. We want to try things, challenge things, and, and it has worked for us. Of course, we won't challenge at your expense, but if we think there's a potential, we will take the chance. And uh, I know uh, Sharif and, uh, and the, we have, have proven himself in many, many of those cases. And if you look at the record for EB1A, I think 
uh, including national, uh, plus national interest waivers. There are hundreds of cases that was uh, that was approved, and so far we have almost a perfect track record. And I really wanted to congratulate this, uh, congratulate him for this, and his team. And um, of course, like we said earlier, Sharif, the O1 national interest waiver and the EB1A are very very good options uh, for people. Uh, without them knowing uh, knowing it, a lot of people kind of give up. They think that they don't qualify for it, and that's what exactly is is the problem. Because uh, if we do an assessment for you, we'll have an idea how things work. Just give us a call, five one zero seven four two five eight eight seven, or just type the website attorneyonair.com, attorneyonair.com. So Sharif, uh, one final words. We have one minute to go, uh, two minutes to go. So. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap up. Just let tell me some final words uh, of wisdom. What what people can can expect, or what do you think uh, they should do? Well, I, I think what you should do is think a little bit more strategically, and also use um, put yourself in the shoes of the adjudicating officer. That's really what I do. That's what I feel like my job is, and that's my duty to the client. I like to put my shoes in the feet of whoever's sitting there in Texas or Nebraska or you know, California, and that's going to review the petition. If you're just going to take a cookie-cutter approach and not offer anything unique or well thought out, then, you know, you're probably going to be um, putting yourself at a disadvantage versus having a more well thought out, more uh, critically analyzed uh, petition, whether that's an O1A, whether it's a national interest waiver, whether it's an EB1A. You have to really look and not only consider what is my uh, skill set, what is my experience, but you need to consider what am I going to do to benefit the United States of America. That is what the government is looking for, America first mentality, right? right. So they want to know what are you going to do for us, and you need someone to articulate that and make the argument for you. Exactly, and here we are to help you. Thank you very much, Sharif. So, uh, for people who need help, just give us a call, 510-742-5887. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Attorney Sharif from Washington, D.C., and I thank you for, for taking some time on your busy schedule, uh, Sharif. Thank you, and uh, we'll hopefully be back in a few weeks and talk about some other topics. So, thank you, Sharif. And, thank you, uh, sir. Mike. It's always a pleasure, Attorney Shaw. Thank you for all your guidance and support, and what you're doing to help so many people out there. It's, uh, you know, very inspirational. Well, thank you so much, and it's the pleasure was all mine. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are done now. We have one more minute to finish the show, just to let people know now, uh, 0742-5887. Unfortunately, I was not able to have uh, a meet today. I apologize for that. So he will be there to next week uh, talking about uh, more issues on, on real estate. So I wanted to thank all the listeners and uh, I, I, I wish all of you a, a great day today. And uh, if you need help, 510-742-5887. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash shop Law, youtube.com slash shop Law. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll be back next week. And again, everything I've told you today is educational in, in nature. You should not act or refrain to act solely on the information provided. Thank you. Bye-bye. KLOK 1170 AM. San Jose, San Francisco, and the entire Bay Area.